Hope you guys had a good week. Pulling up the notes here. I'm trying something new today. I'm going to teach from the notes that I have in my iPad here and see if that works and see if uh, I can stay on task here. But uh, it's good to see you all today. I met many of the people visiting and some who I've not met yet. I hope to meet, but got a good full house of folks today. So it's a blessing and an honor to stand up and teach in front of you. I was telling Stacey, I was just sitting there. I said, I don't know why. Probably since the, the very first time I taught here, I'm like nervous and I'm like trembling. And I don't know if it's because of the topic or if it's because um, there's new people or because I'm teaching from an iPad or whatever the case. Sometimes I feel safe kind of teaching through what we call an expository method where I go verse by verse by verse. And uh, so I feel a little bit off script. But anyways, I'm going to pray real quick and just pray that my nerves are at ease if that's all right. You guys pray with me. Yeah. Father, I just pray that you would put the words that I have to say into my mouth that that you would just um, that I would just be obedient to you and your calling and your leading today. And I pray for everyone in this room that whatever circumstances led them here today, that you would just bless them and richly honor this day uh, as, as we honor your name. And may they walk away strengthened in their faith. May they leave here today encouraged and blessed, but more importantly, knowing that they came and they worshiped and the mission was accomplished today through that. May you ease my nerves and my any anxiety and fear that I might have about the topic or the, the methodology of teaching today. And I'll give you all the glory for it. Hashem, Yeshua, Amen. Amen. Um, hey, Dave. Yes, sir. Are you doing announcements at the end. At the end, I will be doing announcements. Yeah, that's intentional. I'm going to try that today. Yeah. Um, but thank you, though, for keeping me in track. So, uh, yesterday, Stacy and the boys and Bob and Brenda were riding down to help the Meadows move. And thank you for those who were able to help them with that. But um, I thank you. Yeah. <laughs> they always say, you know, who your real friends are come moving day, right? Uh, yeah. So um, Bob was coming over to my house to hook up my utility trailer. I was going to work. And so it was left to Stacy and, and Bob and Brenda to hook up my trailer to his vehicle. And I had pulled my trailer up in the cul-de-sac out in front of our house. And I put one of those trailer hitch locks on it, you know, and so that no one would swipe it in the middle of the night. And the key for it got broken off inside of it when they went to unlock it. And so uh, I have bolt cutters down in the garage and, you know, I, Stacey called me kind of in a panic. She's like, I, I don't know what to do. The trailer's out of commission because it's locked up and we can't get into it. And the, the thing, the key's broken off in it. And I said, oh man, I was like, we got bolt cutters down there in the garage. But I was like, I don't think I could get those bolt cutters through that lock. I said, you know, I, I don't think I'd be able to, you know, those things, you have to bear down on those. You might have a hacksaw maybe, but those, those locks are designed to where you can't clip them off with bolt cutters or very tough locks. And uh, about 15 minutes later, she texts me back. She says, "Never mind, Bob got it. <laughs> and I was like, what? She's like, oh yeah, Bob just clipped it in two different places. And, and then she, when I got home, she was saying, you should have seen Bob. He just bared down on that thing and he just popped that lock right off. And, and then, and then again this morning, as we're pulling out of the driveway, she's like, let me show you the video of Bob using those bolt cutters. And she shows me the video, and sure enough, Bob just goes over there and goes, bink, you know, and just like, I'm like, how did he, he's such a gentle giant, you know, and he's such a nice guy, and he just pops that lock right off like it's butter, and I'm like, man, how did he do that? Don't make him mad. Don't make him mad, yeah. I can't imagine. I'm sure Bob never gets mad, though, right? He never does. Uh-huh. I do, yeah. I don't feel weak. Um, anyways. That's my own unit. That's that I do. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you have a Bible, and I hope you do have some form of a Bible, turn to Hebrews chapter 12. And I know we just finished the book of Ruth and studying through all of Ruth. And I'm not starting a long series on the book of Hebrews or anything like that. I'm just going to start in Hebrews chapter 12. And as you're going there, let me remind you the context of the book of Hebrews. Why is it called Hebrews? Because this was a letter written to Messianic Jews who believe in Yeshua of Nazareth after the Messiah. They're still identifying as Jews. They're still practicing Judaism, still practicing the, the Torah faith. They're wanting to go to the temple. They're wanting to go into their local synagogue. They're still, they're still in every respect Jews, except they believe in Yeshua of Nazareth as their Messiah and the Lord and Savior that was promised to them in Scripture. However, there's a problem because many of the leading religious authorities disagree with that assertion that Yeshua is not the Messiah. The people that control their synagogues, the people that control the temple, are going to disallow them and ban them from those places and not allow them to go into those familiar places and to practice those familiar aspects of their faith. So the writer of Hebrews, we're not sure who that is, is writing this letter, and to summarize it all in one word, 
the entire book of Hebrews is encouragement. Writing to Messianic Jewish believers to encourage them in their faith. Reminding them that, yeah, you may not be able to go to the temple, you may not be able to go to your synagogue, yeah, your property might be seized, your businesses are being shut down, your, your homes are being um, seized as well. But you know what? We have a high priest in a higher realm. We have a worship system and a, and a sacrificial system in a higher realm. Yeah, you could go to Mount Sinai. We've been to Mount Sinai, but you know what? We go to Mount Zion. And that is the fire, the, 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 the all-consuming mountain. And, and he goes on to talk about how, or she goes on to talk about um, how God is an all-consuming fire. You'll hear in the book of Hebrews a lot of like, if then, how much more now kind of language. And that's a very Hebraic literary term. It's called kal the komer. It's like, if that, then how much more this? And you hear that, which is why I believe that um, Paul probably is the most likely candidate to write this book. But we just don't know. I'm not going to hang my faith on that or anything. But look at um, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, we're going to read about six verses real fast. It says, So then, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us too put aside every impediment, that is, the sin which easily entangles or hampers our forward movement, and keep running with endurance in the contest or the race that's set before us, looking away to the initiator and the completer of that trusting, that is Yeshua, who, in exchange for obtaining the joy set before him, he endured the cross as a criminal, scorning the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I like how the NIV translates that. I think it's a little bit better translation where it says that he, um, he, was, he was scorned by those of shame or scorned by sinners. Yes, think about him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners so that you won't grow tired or become despondent. You have not yet res resisted to the point of shedding blood in the contest against sin. Also, you have forgotten the counsel which speaks with you as sons. My son, don't despise discipline of the Lord or become despondent when he corrects you. For Adonai disciplines those he loves and whips everyone he accepts as a son. That's from Proverbs chapter 3. Regard your endurance as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. So in this little section here, Hebrews 1, 1 through 6, the writer of Hebrews is likening our faith, and he's drawing what's called an analogy of our faith to what sport? Running, running. Now, in the 5th century BC, there was a famous battle that took place, and there was a herald that, after the battle was won, ran 26.2 miles to tell the general that they had won. Does anyone know that battle? The Battle of Marathon, yeah. So it could be that the writer of Hebrews is thinking about that. And over time, you know, we developed this Olympic race, and that would have been the case by the first century. They would have had Olympians that were running a marathon or running and doing all these things in the nude. And, and then um, the writer of Hebrews is maybe thinking about that as he's writing this and saying, your faith is like running a great distance. It's like running in those Olympic sports that the Greeks do. Right? That's, I want you to think about your faith like that. It's a brilliant analogy. And he says, if you look at Hebrews 12, look back at it. He says um, in verse 2, looking away, I'm sorry, in verse 1, he says, keep running with hypomenes is the Greek word there. Hypomenes. And that's endurance. It's translated endurance. But it literally means something's been bared up under. It's a bear up under like a weight. And it's also the same word. Turn with me to Matthew 10, verse 22. Matthew 10, 22. Matthew 10, verse 22. Same word used right here. Yeshua, our master, is speaking. He says, everyone will hate you because of me. Sounds a lot like prosperity gospel, right? <laughs> but whoever hypomenes, whoever has endurance till the end will be preserved from harm. Now look at uh, Matthew 24, 13. Matthew 24, 13. Flip over 14 chapters or so. Matthew 24, 14. Matthew. Kind of giving you an idea how this word is used. Matthew 24, 13. Whoever holds out or whoever has hypomenes, which is 
that endurance, that bearing under the weight of something. Whoever holds out until the end will be delivered. And let's look at Romans 12, 12 now. It goes to Acts and then Romans 12. Romans 12, 12. Romans 12, 12. Paul says, rejoice in your hope and be patient in your troubles and continue with hypomenes in prayer, with endurance or bearing weight, right? How many of you have prayed and you have a deep weight on it, heavy weight on you? One more instance of this word I'm going to give and then we're going to move on. Go to 1 Corinthians 13, 7. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. This is the famous love chapter, right? That's, that's prayed at every or recited every wedding. 1 Corinthians. Corinthians 13 and verse 6 and 7. Love does not gloat over other people's sins. Ouch. Come I'm on. Guilty of that. But it takes its delight in the truth. Love always hypomenes. It always trusts. It always hopes. And it always hypomenes. It endures. So you can get a better idea how that word is used. Hypomenes. It literally means to bear up under a load. And with that, I'm going to tell the story. Everybody likes stories. When I was uh, 19, 20 years old, I was in Army College, R Army ROTC, and um, I was training to become an officer in the U.S. Army. And uh, I got a phone call one day it was from a guy who was like a senior classman, and he woke me up from a nap, actually, and he said, Rutledge, I think you need to be on the Ranger Challenge team. And I was like, I have no idea what that is. No, thank you. No, I'm kidding. I didn't know what it was. And I was honored that he would ask, but I was thinking, man, that's going to change my life because um, the Ranger Challenge team was a group of guys who basically represented my college and my ROTC program, my battalion, that would travel around the southeastern United States and they would compete in these various rigorous sports like marksmanship, um, making rope bridges and crossing streams with rope bridges and rappelling and doing rucksack marches and races, doing... Um, running and, and, and push-up contests and all, you, you name it, disassembling M16s and reassembling them while blind, all that stuff. We did that. And this was a big commitment of for time for me to make this commitment. So I told him, yes, I would do it. <laughs> and uh, one of the things we did every single week, we normally had PT, our battalion did like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but I had to come Tuesdays as well at five in the morning have to go to, go to uh, the battalion headquarters there, and we would put one of these things on. And for those who are prior service in the room, you know, this is a large Alice pack, right? They sometimes call it the big green tick. Um, <laughs> yeah. We put one of these on and we would bring it with us, and we had to get it to about 40 pounds was the goal. And then once, once a month or so, we would go and we would, um, we would get in a bus and our battalion commander would drive us to this big competition and there would be like 15 other battalions there represented and ranger challenge teams represented and it'd be like 4 in the morning and we'd all have like glow sticks on us and headlamps and we'd have 40 pound rucksacks and fake M16s and we would, uh, we would just take off running <laughs> and we would, we'd have to all stay together we couldn't split up our team had to stay together in a single file line and we would race about 10 kilometers, and buddy, we would just take off running. We would run, run, run. We'd run for about a mile, walk very quickly for about a mile, run another mile with like a 40-pound rucksack on your back. A picture of that, four in the morning, and it's, you're sweating, things are chafing, right? And it's just, there's, I remember we went to Daytona one time, and it was really salty air, and the wind was blowing up off the coast, and man, it was rough. The air is like, every time you took a breath, your lungs just burn right there on the beach. And, uh, but every Tuesday morning, we'd get these things on, and we'd report and, and just start running. We had this big lake in a, in a town where the college was, and it was three and a half miles around. And our goal was to not stop running. We'd stay together. We used to carry uh, you know, our, our, our fake like dummy M16s, but then the neighbors started calling the college and saying, why are there guys with rucksacks and BDUs running around the lake with M16s at five in the morning? And naturally, you know, I, Understandably, it, it creeped them out a little bit. So then we switched to two by fours. <laughs> so we were carrying two by fours wrapped in, um, in, in green army duct tape, and we were running around the lake 
at five in the morning while people were walking their little golden doodles, you know, and we'd be running by them and we'd be screaming cadences and yelling and getting each other motivated, playing metal music from like these speakers that team captain had. He'd be playing Metallica through these speakers and we'd be all amped up, you know, drinking too much Mountain Dew at that time in the morning. But we would run, man. We'd just try to stay together and just keep up. But one of the things we did, we were practicing for a 10K race one time with, a, with our rucksacks on. And uh, the, uh, the team captain says, okay, we're gonna go five kilometers out. And then everyone's gonna stop. We're gonna stop for 30 seconds. You're gonna find a random buddy and you're gonna switch rucksacks. I was like, oh man. All right, that's not a big deal, we can do that. So we get five kilometers out. We stop and everyone's chugging out of water really fast. And he's like, 10 seconds. Switch rucksacks. And I grabbed this guy's rucksack. He was a young freshman kid. I forget his name. Kind of a wiry little kid. And he was kind of struggling. You know, I felt like maybe I could help him out. And I, I grabbed his rucksack. And he was having a hard time kind of keeping up as he did, as, off, as is often the case. So I grabbed his rucksack and I put it on. He takes mine and puts it on. Should be about the same weight. I realized very quickly, uh-uh, not the same weight. That's why he's struggling. What did I just do, right? But man, okay, everybody ruck up. Let's go five more kilometers. Let's go back home. So we start running, and you know, his rucksack got some bouncing right on my back. I'm like, oh man, he didn't pack his rucksack like I packed mine. Mine was super tight. It was like everything was cinched down, and his, his rucksack, and suddenly I start feeling these like really hard objects digging into the, my kidneys behind me. I'm like, what is that? You know, I'm running, I start limping. What is that? It's like it's giving me like cirrhosis or something. What is going on? Can you get cirrhosis in your kidney? <laughs> But uh, anyways, we get back to the battalion headquarters. I take this thing off. I'm like, man, what do you have in your rucksack? And I start, oh, I start pulling it out. I'm looking in there. I'm like, what do you got in here? And the team captain comes over. And he's like, yeah, what are you, what are you packing in here? You know, this little freshman kid has no idea. And I'm like, we're supposed to be packing like clothes and stuff like that. Or, and man, I was like, man, I'm pulling pull his rucksack out. I got to raise attention. On him. And I pull it out. And he, he's packed college textbooks in his. And they, they are digging into my kidneys. I'm like, what do you do? Why do you have, why do you have the, the works of Shakespeare? Man, come on, the, the tales of Shakespeare. I'm running with this. I just ran five kilometers. I'm drenched in sweat, you know? Dude, come on, you have the, like, Steve Ambrose, D-Day? Come on, why do you have all these things in your rucksack? You're just supposed to pack clothes, right? And I got angry with him because I, he just subjected me to, like, torture of the kidneys for five kilometers, right? But I didn't realize, I didn't have compassion that moment for him and say, wait a second, he doesn't understand the instructions. And I didn't have compassion thinking, this is why this kid has been struggling for so long. Oh, wow. Because he's been under that pain. I had no idea what was in his rucksack. And all this time we've been practicing and doing these races and all this stuff, he's been under that pain and hasn't told us about it. He just thought that was normal, that your kidneys are next to failing by the time you're done with the race. And... I was, sitting, um, I was sitting with a visitor last week. You guys remember Michael, if you had a chance to meet him, a really nice guy I visited last week from Panama City. And I had a chance to sit and talk with him at Oneg, and we had a great talk. He's a, he's a triathlete. He does a lot of long distance running and biking. And, and for those of you who know me, um, Chris and I are training for a marathon right now. So um, 10 mile run tomorrow morning. So why we're doing that, I don't know. But I sat next to him. I sat next to Michael. And I just started asking him questions about the marathon. He's run five marathons in his life. And I said, you know, tell me, what would you do for your first one? What would you do differently? Well, you know, what do you recommend I do? And he just started like pouring all this wisdom. And he's like, man, the best, the best advice I have for someone in your shoes who's getting ready to run his first marathon, as you're training, it's so important you pay attention to your body as you're training. Because he's like, you can have all the endurance you want, but when you're training, if you mess up, you're done. He's like, as you're training, pay attention to this. He's like, push through discomfort, but pause and assess pain. He's like, you have to know as an athlete, what is the difference between discomfort and pain? Big difference, big difference. And I was like, whoa, I never thought about that. You know, if I start feeling this pain in my hip, or my, my calf starts cramping up, like I never thought about, yeah, that's a painful thing, but there's like deep pain, but then there's discomfort. He says, push through discomfort. Let me give you some examples of discomfort. And Chris and I have experienced some of these, more me than him. But shortness of breath is discomfort, right? You guys like being out of breath? <laughs> I dislike that, right? That's just, that's uncomfortable. Push through it. If you're an athlete and you're training, or you're trying to lose weight, you're trying to change your lifestyle, you push through shortness of breath, right? You don't pass out, but you push through it. 
right? Another example would be fatigue. You push through fatigue. If you're obviously a long distance runner, you want, you're gonna get fatigued and you push through it. Another example would be hunger. I get hungry sometimes when Chris and I are out there running and I haven't eaten breakfast yet and we just ran eight miles last Sunday morning. I started getting hungry and I started having cravings for like some, some uh, cinnamon toast crunch, right? And I was picturing myself hitting up the Waffle House after the run and down in some waffles and stuff. You get hungry, but what do you do? Do you stop? You push through it. Thirst. I get thirsty when I'm out there running. And I have little canteens that I carry with me sometimes, little water bottles, and I down those, and I get thirsty, but I push through it. Now, if I start getting a splitting headache, or if my, my body starts you know, getting goosebumps, or I stop sweating, that's a bigger problem. I'm not gonna push through that, right? Now, I believe the writer of Hebrews is saying that hardships are analogous. Anal analogous? Analogous, thank you. Analogous to persecution. That the discomfort is like persecution. And we're promised persecution. Let me, show, let me prove it to you. Go to John 15, 19. John 15, 19. John 15, 19. We push through discomfort. John 15, 19. We can back up to 18. John 15, 18. If the world hates you, understand that it first hated me. If you belong to the world, the world would have loved its own. But because you don't belong to the world, on the contrary, I have picked you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a slave is not greater than his master. So right there, I believe discomfort is like persecution. There are people that think you're weird, people that ostracize you, that's uncomfortable. But you know what, do we push through it or do we stop in the race that is our faith? We push through it, right? That gets us stronger, right? And I remember um, one time, Chris and I, we, we pushed through a lot of fatigue one time. We were doing three. We, did, we were on a third lap around the Westgate Trail. We're nearing about nine or ten miles. And I remember we passed a couple people like two times. And they remarked. They were like, how far are you guys going, right? But it was like we pushed through that discomfort. And in doing so, we caught other people's attention, right? And then we told them, well, we're training for a half marathon. And then we're doing a marathon, right, as we're running by them. You push through that discomfort. But what's pain? If our faith is like a race, what is pain in this race? What is pain? Pain is this. Now, some of you in this room, you are seasoned athletes and you've done multiple marathons and you're like, why are you doing this game? You know, it's a waste of your time. <laughs> Here you <go. laughs> Some of you are, you know, professional, former, former, uh, uh, semi-pro or pro athletes or whatever and some of you know and when you're training or you're in the game if you hurt yourself and you have a deep injury that injury is going to come up again if you're not careful right some of you like man my knees are shot or my hips are shot my shoulders are shot i wish i could do those things still and if i got out and i pushed through that pain now i would do irreparable damage to my body or there's certain movements or certain, I can't run, but I can bite because the running causes concussion in my hips and that hurts. There's certain movements that trigger that pain, right? And I believe in the race that is our faith, the pain that you're not supposed to push through and ignore is what we call in modern times, this stuff called trauma, <clears throat> trauma. And I looked up a definition of trauma. Trauma is either past or it's ongoing. It's an emotional response to a terrible event like an accident, rape, or even natural disaster. Now, if I ask for a show of hands, how many of you have been through trauma in your life? I would bet that most, if not all of us in this room have. Let me give you a list, and I just looked this up. Let me give you a list of the most common forms of trauma that a human being experienced today. The untimely death of a child, the untimely death of a parent, untimely death of a spouse, the causing, causing the death of another human being, diagnosis of a serious disease or illness, intense physical injury, abandonment by a spouse, abuse, whether emotional, physical, sexual, or all of the above, the loss of a job, the loss of a home, long-term imprisonments, 
prolonged addiction, marital infidelity, prolonged stress and adrenal burnouts, divorce, and deep prolonged poverty. Poverty. There's more than I just read there, but again, if I ask for a show of hands, how many in this room have experienced one or some of those things? Many of you, if not all of you, would raise your hand. I would. You see, like a sports injury, there are certain movements and certain things that can trigger the memory of that trauma, right? And this is like a psychological term, I'm not just it's trying to sound funny, but triggers can include sights, sounds, smells, or thoughts that remind you of that traumatic event in some way. And triggers can be non-tangible as well, like the following. That's how my ex-husband used to talk to me when he was drinking. Or, it's my late wife's birthday today. Or, you didn't answer your phone for two hours. I, I was never disrespected that way when I was in prison. Or, this was her favorite toy. These little things that can trigger that injury in us as we're just trying to run the race. And everyone in this room, I'm going to submit, has had those experiences, unfortunately. The triggers of trauma, they turn into what we call manifestations of the trauma. They include things like paranoia, like everyone's out to get me, or everyone is wi just waiting for an excuse to talk behind my back, or I can never really develop a close, intimate relationship with a friend or family member because I have been, that trust has been severed in my life. So you develop this long and, and very universal mistrust of other humans. Intense guilt is another manifestation of trauma. Low self-esteem, blame, relapsing, oversheltering of children, hoarding, overworking, loss of attraction to the opposite gender, overly defensive, short-tempered, irrational fear of new relationships. Again, I'm just pulling these off of this, the American Psychological Association's website. But as people in this room that have a biblical worldview, what is the real root of all that trauma? Marvin just said it. It's sin. And if we believe the Bible, it's what happened in the garden. And so that traumatic experience or experiences that you have in your mind right now are a result of our disobedience. And they are a reminder that we need a savior. Trauma is it's like the ripples of the effects of sin that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. And some of us in this room are trying to do a good job of clawing our way out of that cycle and saying, no, I'm not going to participate in that cycle of dysfunction and trauma. I'm going to do the best job at being a father as I can, the best job at being a husband as I can, or I'm not going to let that thing change the course of my life. And that's really tough as you're running that race. Because we're running that race, it's like you might round a bend and you slip on a rock and your ankle turns a weird way and it triggers that injury. And guess what? You have to take a step back. Stop. No, I can't push through this pain right now. But it's so important that we recognize that. That is a pain in my life. That is an injury in my life. And I'm not just going to push through and ignore it it's, it and pretend like it's not even there. Let me ask you this rhetorical question. Does the memory and the effects of trauma ever leave a human being? Absolutely not. Yes, it does. If you focus your mind on the Word of God, and shut all the garbage out. We're going to talk about that. And very good. In my experience of counseling human beings and doing what I do, trauma stays with a human being the rest of their life. Now, does that determine that person's identity or future? No. no. You see, the effects of trauma and how we relate to it, how we feel it, they can be diminished. But it's important that those who are walking with trauma remember how it most likely manifests in them. Just like an injured athlete remembers what movements can trigger that pain. 
It would be foolish of us to not think about that and to be cognizant of that. Foolish. Because with trauma, with the ripples of sin in our life, we have a choice. And the choice is this. In my pain, I will cause others pain. That's option A. Option B, in my pain, and because of my Redeemer, I will be an agent of healing for others who have pain. That's a tough choice, but it's doable. The goal is this, full healing and restoration from trauma, where you can't even feel a thing. I would love just not ever remember that. But until his kingdom, until he wipes every tear from every eye, we live with the reality of sin in this world. And if we are foolishly pushing that off and saying, no, I'm not, gonna, I'm not even gonna think about that. And I'm just gonna drive on and push through that pain. Guess what? You're gonna hurt yourself and you're gonna hurt other people. And I know a lot of people that, here's what they do. They have a deep-seated pain in their life, a traumatic experience in their life. And they take the word of God and they cram it in their heads and they put this on and that on. And they celebrate this. They don't eat that. And then it kind of wears off a little bit. And then somebody triggers that pain in their life. And suddenly they hurt themselves and they hurt other people. Last year, about this time, I taught on healing at the cross before ta- Torah at, at Sinai. Some of you may remember that. <laughs> Because I fully believe that if you step into this walk, this faith, and you start learning this and that, but you have not received healing, then you're going to mess yourself and other people up. Amen. So back to Hebrews 12. If you got a Bible. And as you're going back to Hebrews 12, let me read to you Galatians 6.2. As we run our race together, Paul says, which here Paul is making an analogy of our faith to a race, which is another reason why I believe he wrote the book of Hebrews. As we run our race together as a team, just like our Ranger Challenge team, right? It is important we share each other's burdens. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. It's just like I carried that freshman's rucksack that was full of textbooks. Ouch, that hurt. Man, I've got pain in my life. I've got tra- traumatic experiences in my life, but gosh, if this person wants to come over in my house and sit down at the dining room table and unload on me, Paul says, carry each other's burdens. Lift them up. And you never know, sometimes it just aligns perfectly where you're like, you know what? I know exactly what you're going through. Let me tell you why. And let me tell you how I overcame that pain and how I found healing from that pain. Let me be an agent of that in your life. I want to challenge you guys to stretch yourselves. You know, in this time of teshuvah and repentance leading up to the high holy days, it's important that we do that. That we build trustworthy friends. We make those friendships. We express vulnerability to each other. And be trustworthy to that friend. Express to them your pain. Because if I'm running with Chris and I'm like, oh, Chris, yeah, just, and I just duck out. And he's like, what happened? Did I say something that hurt his feelings? <laughs> I remember one time we were running and we just hit the 10 mile mark and my left calf, for some reason, just locked up. I couldn't take a step further. And I just stopped. And I had my phone on me and I... I took it out of my little fanny pack and texted him thinking that he was going to check his and hear it through his little earbuds. And and I texted him and said, man, I can't go a step further. And he was already maybe a couple hundred feet up ahead of me. Can't go any further. My calf just locked up. I stopped. And I turned back and I started walking back towards our car, like limping, you know, and working that cramp out of my calf. And lo and behold, I get back to the car and I'm waiting there for like 30 minutes thinking, okay, he should be back by now. Where is Chris at? And uh, I thought maybe he's he's out there in in the trail, like just keeled over or something from exhaustion. And so I'm like, I don't know what to do. I tried calling him a few times and answer his phone. I'm like, man, I can't, I, can't, I can't move. I can't go to him and check on him and make sure he's okay. So I just left. <laughs> I didn't know what else to do. I tried calling him a bunch of times. On the way home, I called Stacy. I said, I'm worried about Chris. I can't get a hold of Chris. I even drove around Westgate, but the trail weaves through the woods so much there's no way I can see him. I get home, and an hour or so later, he calls me. Man, where'd you go? 
well, dude, I, I tried to tell you, I was worried about you. Where, where were you? I was waiting for you in the car, you know? And he's like, oh, I was actually jogging in place in the bushes waiting for you. I was gonna jump out and scare you. I thought, oh, gee, okay. It's gonna be like that. So that's how that went. But I want you to be cognizant of those responses and those manifestations of trauma in your life and how they influence your interactions with one another. And couples, couples listen, or even those that are unmarried but you plan to be married, listen. It is very likely that your spouse has walked through a traumatic event or events. And the thing not to do is to go like, well, you need to get over that. Well, you need to just kind of grow up. That was way in the past. If it's infidelity, it's not like, well, I, you, need to, you need to get over it. Quit checking on me so much. Quit trying to call me so much. Quit snooping around on my phone. No, it's saying, I'm an open book to you. Here's my phone. Here's my passwords. Sorry I missed your call. I love you. It's knowing that they have a traumatic event in their life and meeting them halfway in that. Now, the other spouse needs to learn to trust. The other spouse needs to overcome that and be healed from that. But in the meantime, let's all pray for a total and complete healing and restoration. And as the writer of Hebrews says, let us run with perseverance, bearing up under a weight, right? The race that is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on who? As one thing Michael was telling me, he said, sometimes your mind starts to play games with you when you're out there for three hours running. He said, you need to visualize yourself crossing a finish line. Just like we need to keep our eyes fixed on Yeshua. He is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And then lastly, let's pray for his kingdom to come soon and in our days so that the powers of darkness and the ripples of sin in this world that can so easily be passed from generation to generation that they're exposed and true justice is established. I'm going to close in prayer. Abba, Father, I pray that right now that if there's people who have grown weary in this room from an event or an experience in their life, in their past, I pray that you would put people in their path that would help bear up their burden. Father, if there's patterns of behaviors that are a direct result of some traumatic experience in our life. Help us to be aware of that, to navigate through that. Help us to be healed of that. I thank you for Yeshua who bled and died when we were still dead in our sin. And by his stripes, we are healed. And we long for your kingdom and we long for the reversal of of the curse of sin and death in this world. May it be soon and in our days. I pray all this in Yeshua's matchless name. Amen. Amen. So I'm reversing things a little bit here, but before we close with the Aaronic benediction, did we decide I'm doing it or are you doing it? I'm doing it, okay. Uh, the Rosh Hashanah celebration is tomorrow down in Cottonwood at 365 Mount, Mount Zion Road. Diane is hosting it. And... Um, I need some people who, do we need tables out there? I'm looking at Diane.